Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me over your lunch break for a quick update on the 2019 COPD guidelines. I'm Dr. Sue Bollmeyer, a professor of pharmacy practice here at the college, and I practice in ambulatory care medicine at the South County Health Center. There are no relevant financial interests um, to disclose for myself or my spouse from, from within the past 12 months. And the learning objectives for today's webinar are to review the updated 2019 gold COPD guidelines. At the end of the webinar, pharmacists will be able to identify stages of COPD using gold grade and risk stratification and to describe recommendations for escalation of drug therapy in patients with COPD experiencing either worsening dyspnea or frequent exacerbations. If you have a question for me throughout the webinar, feel free to put it in the chat box located on the uh, bar on your right of the screen. Most likely I'll try to answer those questions at the end. So let's get going with some questions to just get you thinking. A patient with a post-bronchodilator FEV1 FEC of 65% and an FEV1 of 70% pre um, percent presents with a COPD assessment test or a CAT score today of 11 and has never had a COPD exacerbation. Which of the following best stages and assigns a risk category for this patient's COPD? So A would be gold grade two, risk category B. Selection B is gold grade one and risk category A. C is gold grade two, risk category D is in dog, and then choice D is gold grade one, risk category B. Next question. A patient with a gold grade three COPD is started on Spiriva Respimat, so some teatropium. At the six month follow up appointment, the patient continues to complain of frequent episodes of feeling winded, tired, and short of breath. Which of the following changes to drug therapy is most appropriate? A, add a LABA ICS combination, B, add an ICS, C, add roflumilast, or D, add a LABA. The gold guidelines have been around for nearly 20 years, with the first report being published in 2001. A gold science subcommittee consists of well-respected multidisciplinary group of researchers and thought leaders in pulmonary medicine. They meet twice a year to review research on COPD management and prevention. Any changes to the guidelines have to be approved by the full committee and are based on the best available evidence uh, at the time. COPD is defined as a disease that is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation that is due to airway and or alveolar abnormalities, usually caused by significant exposure to noxious particles or gases down in the airway. COPD is what I call an umbrella term, and under that umbrella are both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. COPD is currently the fourth leading cause of death worldwide and is projected to be the third cause of death by 2020. COPD is a public health challenge because it is both preventative and treatable. COPD should be considered in any patient who has dyspnea, chronic cough, or sputum production, and or a history of exposure to risk factors for the disease like smoking cigarettes or occupational exposures to noxious gases or particles. Remember, spirometry or PFTs are required to confirm a diagnosis. PFTs or pulmonary function testing should include an assessment of pre and post bronchodilator FEV1, FEV1 FVC ratio, and an FVC. A quick review of those terms are forced expiratory volume in one second and the forced vital capacity. Next, let's talk about two questionnaires that can be given to patients to gauge their symptoms. The first is the COPD assessment test, or CAT. The COPD assessment test, or CAT score, it's an eight item measure of health status impairment in COPD. The scores range from zero to 40. The higher the score, the worse the patient's symptoms on their overall health status. The other measure that is often used is the MMRC, or Modified Medical Research Council Dyspnea Scale. We're going to look at that on the next slide. The MMRC only gauges how short of breath a patient with COPD is. You can see from the slide that scores range from zero, so I only get breathless with strenuous exercise, to four. I'm too breathless to leave the house. 
Patients should only choose one grade on this scale. The next thing to briefly review before we discuss the A, B, C, D risk stratification of our COPD patients is simply how to determine an, an exacerbation risk. Exacerbations are defined as a worsening of COPD symptoms that requires additional therapy beyond their maintenance medications. Exacerbations that are mild um, can be treated with just a quick acting uh, beta agonist only. Moderate exacerbations are if, the, if a SABA, so a short acting beta agonist and an antibiotic plus or minus oral steroids are required. And then severe exacerbations, that's gonna be when patients require hospitalizations or an ER visit. Severe exacerbations may also mean acute respiratory failure. Again, these terms will be important when reviewing the next slide. The GOLD guidelines first introduced the ABCD risk stratification tool in 2016 as a combined assessment approach. What this does is it combines a symptomatic assessment with the patient's spirometric classification and or risk of exacerbations. So moving from left to right across this slide, a patient has PFTs that confirm a diagnosis of COPD with a post-bronchodilator FEV1 FVC ratio of less than 70% predicted. They are then staged into gold grade one, two, three, or four based on their post FEV1. Next, an assessment of their symptoms and risk of exacerbation takes place to stratify, to stratify their risk of future exacerbations. That happens by determining patient symptoms, so that MMRC or the CAT score, and then a history of moderate or severe exacerbations. So zero to one um, exacerbations with no hospital admission, or at least one with a hospital admission, or at least two total in the past year. Patients are then assigned an A, B, C, or D risk category or risk stratification. Let's look at an example. So Mike's a longtime cigarette smoker. He's got an 80 pack year history. He smoked two packs a day since he was 18. He recently cut back to, cut back to one and a half packs a day. Um, he gets short of breath with moderate exertion um, and even at rest sometimes. He has used his son's albuterol but tries not to do that very often. Patient agrees to undergo uh, spirometric testing and that shows us a post-bronchodilator FEV1 of 76% and an FEV1 FVC ratio less than 70 at 68%. His symptoms occur with exertion and um, like I said, they're present at rest some days. He's never been to the emergency room or been hospitalized for COPD and his CAT score today is 11. So remember back to our risk stratification tool uh, we, we use to assess our patients. And we know Mike has COPD because his FEV1, FVC post bronchodilator is less than 70%. And he's gold grade two because his post FEV1 was 76%. So that range between 50 and 79. Next, we know he's in risk group B as in boy because his CAT score was greater than 10 at 11. And he's never had a moderate or severe exacerbation. So therefore he's gold grade two risk group B. Once COPD is diagnosed and patients are placed into a risk category, so that A, B, C, or D, they are given treatment. Our goals of treating stable COPD are twofold. To reduce patient symptoms, but also reduce the risk of future exacerbations. As we know, COPD exacerbations increase morbidity and mortality, as well as overall treatment costs. For initial pharmacologic management, patients fall into group A, should be offered bronchodilator treatment based on its effect on breathlessness. And this can be either, you know, a short acting agent. So like a SAVA, short acting beta agonist, or a SAMA, a short acting muscarinic antagonist, or a combination like Combinet. If preferred, you can use a long acting agent um, for group A patients as well. Initial management of group B should consist of a long acting bronchodilator. There's no evidence to suggest one group over another for initial relief of symptoms, so a LABA or a LAMA is okay to pick. Initial therapy for group C patients should consist of a LAMA because it is superior to LABAs at preventing exacerbations. Group D initial therapy should start with a LAMA because of its effects on both breathlessness and exacerbation rates. 
For patients with more severe symptoms, so those are going to be our patients with a high CAT score greater than or equal to 20, especially if those symptoms are driven by a lot of breathlessness, uh, exercise limitation, a LAMA-LABA combo can be chosen. In some patients, ICS-LABA uh, may be the initial first choice. And this therapy has the greatest likelihood of working if patients have a high eosinophil count, greater than 300, mil 300 cells per microliter. LABA ICS may also be the first choice if patients have a history of asthma. Now, there is one thing I want to point out about ICS um, use in patients with COPD. In this patient population, it's been shown to increase risk of pneumonia. So we do want to weigh the risk versus benefit ratio. It's always important to remember that at each follow-up, we're looking for a review of symptoms. So how dyspneic are they, are the patients, and how many exacerbations had the, has the patient had um, in the, since we saw them last. We would assess their inhaler technique, ensure they've been adherent to their therapy, also review any non-farm um, techniques like smoking cessation, perhaps recommending them for pulmonary rehab, um, giving them self-management education tips can also be useful. Adjusting therapy is next, and that can consist of increasing or decreasing their medications, but also switching devices if a patient can't master theirs appropriately. If response to initial therapy is appropriate, patients are doing well, we just maintain them on that. If not, we want to consider what their predominant um, complaint is or what their treatable trait to target is, and that's going to usually be either dyspnea or exacerbation rates. So you'll put the patient kind of in the box corresponding to their current treatment and follow the indications um, per guidelines. Assess their response, adjust their therapy, and review again at the next follow-up. Now remember, once patients are on initial therapy, we no longer really consider that A, B, C, D um, assessment at their diagnosis. So once on therapy, guidelines have pretty detailed pathways or treatment algorithms to apply to patients during follow-up appointments. These pathways can be applied to any patient already taking maintenance treatments or maintenance medications, irrespective of their goal group allocated at treatment initiation. The need to further treat dyspnea or prevent further exacerbations should be evaluated at every follow-up. So for patients, um, we're going to talk about um, patients having worsening dyspnea first. So for patients with persistent breathlessness or exercise limitation on a long-acting bronchodilator monotherapy, the use of two bronchodilators is recommended. Always think about the patient's ability to use the pulmonary device they're prescribed. And like I said, if they can't master it, consider switching within the class to a different device or a different molecule. For patients already on a LABA ICS and still having persistent breathlessness or exercise limitation, add a LAMA for triple therapy. At all stages, dyspnea from other causes should be investigated and treated. Also, again, inhaler technique and adherence should be considered causes of poor control. If ICS was started inappropriately, so the patient wasn't having any exacerbations or they possibly didn't have an asthma component to their disease, switching them to a drug that will give them better symptom control, like a LAMA LABA, is warranted. Also, other reasons to discontinue ICS would be a lack of response, so they're, um, you know, they're, they're not showing any improvement or they're having side effects. Next, we're going to talk about patients having exacerbations. So for patients on a long-acting bronchodilator monotherapy that have persistent exacerbations, escalation to a combo LABA-LAMA or LABA-ICS is recommended. LABA-ICS is going to be preferred if the patient has a history of asthma. Also, blood eosinophil counts may help identify patients that will have a better response to ICS. For patients with one exacerbation per year, with a uh, peripheral blood level eosinophil count of greater than 300, the ICS LABA would be preferred. If patients have at least uh, two or more moderate exacerbations per year, or at least one severe exacerbation that required hospitalization in the prior year, LABA ICS treatment can be considered at even a lower um, count, so greater than or equal to 100. The key here really is, ICS effects are more pronounced in patients with greater frequency and or severity of exacerbations. 
If patients are on a LAMA, LAMA therapy and experience exacerbations, there are two pathways to pick from. If the blood eosinophil counts less than 100, um, that can be used to predict a low response um, to ICS. So LABA, LAMA, ICS, um, if the blood eosinophil count is greater than 100. Or you could add roflumilast or azithromycin if the blood um, eosinophil count is low. For those um, patients, um, LABA, ICS therapy, uh, and they're having frequent exacerbations, we recommend escalation to triple therapy by adding a LAMA. Also, you can switch to just LABA, LAMA if no response to ICS has been seen or side effects to ICS warrant it, like pneumonia. If on triple therapy and they have exacerbations, two options should be considered. You can add roflumilast, so if the FEV1 is less than 50% predicted and they have chronic bronchitis, especially if they experience at least one hospitalization for an exacerbation in the previous year. Also, the other option would be to add azithromycin. The best ev evidence for azithromycin is if the patient is not a current smoker, but remember um, there has been, there is evidence and data that shows this can um, cause resistant organisms. As I previously stated, um, we discontinue the inhaled corticosteroid if patients experience pneumonia or a lack of effi efficacy, so they're still having frequent exacerbations. If the blood eosinophil count is less than 300 and we discontinue the inhaled steroid, these patients actually have the greatest likelihood of experiencing exacerbations after that ICS is discontinued. So we would just want to monitor them pretty closely. All right, so we're back to our questions. A patient with a post-bronchodilator FEV1 FVC of 65% and an FEV1 of 70% present with a COPD assessment test or a CAT score today of 11, and they've never had a COPD exacerbation. Which of the following best stages and assigns a risk category for this patient's COPD? So the correct answer is actually A, gold grade two, because his post FEV1 is 70%, so between that 50 and 79% predicted, and risk group B is a boy, because his CAT score is greater than 10, but he's never had a COPD exacerbation. Next question. A patient with gold grade three COPD is started on Spireva Respimat, so some teotropium, a llama. At the six-month follow-up appointment, the patient continues to complain of frequent ex episodes of feeling winded, tired, and short of breath. Which of the following changes to drug therapy is most appropriate? So remember, this patient, uh, we would go with the dyspnea pathway because that's what he's mainly complaining of at, at, at follow-up, and he's on a LAMA. So the next thing we would do following the pathway would be to add a LAMA. So the two bronchodilators is recommended. Also, always think about the patient's ability to use the pulmonary device they've been prescribed. If for some reason they can't master it, consider switching within the class to a different device or molecule. So in this question, the correct answer would be um, to add a LABA to the LAMA. And with that, I will take any questions that anyone has. There haven't been any typed, so I'll wait a couple seconds to see if anybody has anything for me. Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and call um, this webinar as complete. Thank you guys so much for your attendance. Have a great rest of the day.